He's been called the Butcher of Bosnia. The trial of Ratko Mladic nears a close. Could this be justice at last for Srebrenica genocide victims? Also on today's programme, executing Article 50, but who pulls the trigger? The British government takes on top judges over who begins the Brexit. And in picture this, picking up the pieces after America's deadliest fire in more than a decade. Hello and welcome. I'm Imran Garda and this is The Newsmakers. It's a court case 20 years in the making. In the aftermath of the ethnically charged Yugoslav wars, the UN set itself an ambitious goal, find and punish all of those responsible. They set up a tribunal to prosecute crimes against humanity. More than 80 war criminals have so far been convicted. And now, the last major case is nearing its conclusion. Prosecutors have begun their closing arguments in the trial of Bosnian Serb commander Ratko Mladic. They say he oversaw the massacre of thousands of Muslim men and boys at Srebrenica. Today's newsmaker is accused war criminal Ratko Mladic as we ask whether this trial will finally bring closure for the victims of the war that tore the Balkans apart. It remains the worst massacre in Europe since World War II. 8,000 people, mostly men and boys, were slaughtered at Srebrenica over the course of a few days in the summer of 1995 in the heat of the Bosnian War. They were targeted for being Bosniaks, a Slavic group that is mostly Muslim. Srebrenica was part of a larger strategy orchestrated by Bosnian Serb political leader Radovan Karadzic to ethnically cleanse large parts of Bosnia of Muslims and Croats, with the aim of carving out a pure Serbian state during the violent breakup of the former Yugoslavia. In his words, skinning the cat before the whole world. Karadzic was sentenced to 40 years in prison in March at The Hague. Now, the man prosecutors say was his partner in war crimes, Bosnian Serb commander Ratko Mladic, is facing life imprisonment for two counts of genocide and nine counts of crimes against humanity. A man nicknamed the Butcher of Bosnia. When the Bosnian War ended in 1995, Ratko Mladic spent 16 years on the run. Mladic's trial is the last major case at the International Criminal Tribunal for the former Yugoslavia which has convicted and sentenced 83 people on all sides of the conflict. Mladic has always maintained he did nothing wrong and that his military campaigns were designed only to protect the Serb people, but prosecutors say different. Mladic used his control of his subordinates to achieve the cleansing he had told the 16th Assembly would be difficult through a pattern of terrible crimes. In municipality after municipality, the cleansing campaign tore apart non-Serb families and communities, the burned out and empty shells of Muslim and Croat villages, and mass graves full of victims, while many of those who had not been killed or fled huddled in terror in camps, waiting to see which detainees would be the next to be brutalized. Mladic has filed an appeal, but a judgment is likely to be delivered next year the final reckoning of Europe's last major conflict. Randolph Nogle, The Newsmakers. Dr. Nevin Andjelic joins me now from London. He's a senior lecturer in international relations and human rights at Regents University and author of Bosnia-Herzegovina, The End of a Legacy. Thanks so much for joining us, Dr. Andjelic. Is Ratko Mladic an evil man? I'm sure he is. Uh, the, the, this has been proven uh, throughout uh, the later stages of his military career. Uh, his role uh, in, in the war in Bosnia-Herzegovina uh, with a, a huge number of victims, uh, with the, the whole population being affected by his actions or by the actions of uh, the army, the situation that he created and provided with the opportunity uh, criminal-minded uh, uh, thugs to commit such horrible crimes, uh, he, he must be evil man. Man. Maybe uh, the, the, in the conversation with the Serbian uh, prosecutor, uh, he, he told me that 
that uh, Mladic requested uh, strawberries and uh, uh, books uh, by Dostoevsky. Uh, so wow. maybe he was uh, started. Uh, he started thinking about crime and punishment at the time, or maybe he just wanted to read uh, *Idiot* or a *Gambler*. I, I have no idea. But uh, 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 I think that uh, this issue of crime and punishment uh, is going to remain with his life, but also with the, the lives of all affected uh, by the Bosnian yeah, war. Yeah, that's intriguing because I, I asked that question and I used that word "evil" precisely because I had Dostoevsky in, in, in mind. Let me then ask you. He's an old man, he's a frail man, he probably doesn't have too many years left. He faces life imprisonment uh, for the remainder of what he has left for those charges, those two counts of genocide, nine counts of crimes against humanity and war crimes. Does it sound like a fitting punishment that he's going to spend the remainder of his years at The Hague? I think uh, the, this is uh, the only available uh, punishment, really. And uh, if we are witnessing the last uh, uh, accused uh, of war crimes during the Second World War being uh, rounded uh, in, in, before the courts uh, uh, right now, uh, then uh, it, it means that, uh, yes, it is necessary, regardless how old uh, they are, how sick they might be by, by the time of their arrest, uh, uh, but uh, uh, the victims Victims need these, uh, as you mentioned, they need, it, need these for, for a kind of closure, although I don't think it is ever going to be achieved, uh, the, the full closure. They are going to live for the rest of their lives uh, with this on, on their mind. Yes, I mean, so there was Milosevic who died while on trial, there's Karadic who was sentenced, and now Ratko Mladic will probably, you know, be sentenced to life imprisonment. In many ways, those were the three biggest, right? So how, how much can we say that will be closure for Bosnia-Herzegovina to now focus on building their country and not looking back at the Balkans war. Do you believe it will be closure? Uh, unfortunately, I don't think so. And uh, the problem is that for uh, over 20 years now, the post-war Bosnia-Herzegovina has uh, managed what uh, the, the governing nationalists on all three sides have, have managed was to divide society. Uh, once upon a time, it was uh, one society. Now, one could talk about three divided societies, and uh, it's only a kind of weak state system that is keeping them together. Therefore, they have separate education, and through the education, they are educating new generations who don't remember the war, who are now reaching, who are at university uh, education right now, who uh, possibly never met somebody from the other ethnic group, uh, who live their separate lives and uh, have been educated through the system that is not good, the old uh, good elements of the education system in Bosnia and Herzegovina have been destroyed. And uh, uh, I think that uh, uh, it is perpetuating, really, uh, the situation over there, whilst the rest of the world is uh, progressing uh, going forward. And uh, the, this is uh, the, really the political decision that has to be made to change this. And uh, uh, I don't see the force uh, uh, in Bosnia and Herzegovina right now for this. Uh, I think international community, as they have been involved in bringing mm -hmm. justice uh, with uh, setting up International Criminal Tribunal for former Yugoslavia in The Hague, they should uh, go for political action now and, and uh, provide a different electoral system uh, that would enable uh, not nationalists to come in power. Fascinating. Hopefully this closes a chapter for many of the families of the victims and others. Dr. Neven Andjelic, unfortunately we are out of time. Good to talk to you. Hope to talk to you again in the not-too-distant future. More than 17 million Britons voted to leave the European Union. But who actually has the authority to make it happen? That's the debate underway in the UK Supreme Court. The government is appealing a ruling stating that members of Parliament have the final say on triggering Brexit. Depending on which side you're on, the final decision will either ignore the will of the people or violate the Constitution. As the legal wrangling grinds on, the EU has a message for the UK. The sooner you get on with it, the better. Natalie Pohernan reports. The UK's journey to Brexit is facing another fork in the road. The Supreme Court is hearing an appeal about just who can start the process of leaving the European Union. Is it the government or is it Parliament? The court is being asked to overturn last month's High Court decision. 
It ruled the government needed the approval of Parliament to trigger Article 50 of the Lisbon Treaty, which will begin two years of Brexit talks. But in its appeal, the government is arguing it can act alone because it has centuries-old powers known as royal prerogative. The Supreme Court verdict due in January will be final. If the government wins the case, Prime Minister Theresa May can invoke Article 50. Questions to the Prime Minister. But if the government loses, Parliament could delay or put extra conditions on the process or even block it. Theresa May has promised to trigger Article 50 in March. That'll be nine months since the UK voted to leave the EU. Polarisation around Brexit remains high, flaring up once again around this latest case. But Theresa May won't budge. The opposition and members of her own party have called on the government to outline their Brexit plan for issues like immigration and access to the EU's single market. The EU's advice is keep calm and negotiate. Negotiations will not start before notification. The single market and its four freedoms, four freedoms are indivisible. Cherry picking is not an option. Creating another challenge on Britain's journey to its grand exit. Natalie Pohonen, The Newsmakers. Well, joining me now from London is Ian Dunt. He's the editor-in-chief of politics.co.uk and author of Brexit, What the Hell Happens Now? And also from London, Ben Harris-Quinney. He's the chairman of conservative think tank, The Bow Group. Gentlemen, thank you very much for joining us. Ben, I'm guessing you're not too keen on this process that's been occurring so far with uh, both the High Court and the Supreme Court. Well, yes and no. Um, I'm not keen on it because I think it's a very clear attempt uh, by the people that, that launched the challenge to vexate the democratic will of the British people over Brexit. I am keen on it, actually, because what almost everyone has missed about this case is that it doesn't actually uh, only... Uh, it, it's not only relevant to Brexit. It's, it, the, the question that is being asked... Uh, in the Supreme Court is not should the United Kingdom leave the European Union or not. The question is who is sovereign in the United Kingdom to make decisions. And actually, I would quite like uh, Parliament to be able to hold the executive uh, of our government to account to the maximum extent possible. Because this case will set a precedent um, that will affect things like the decision to go to war in Iraq, the ability of, of the Prime Minister to make um, unilateral executive decisions. And I don't think that's a good thing. I think uh, the government of, uh, government of any colour needs to be held to account by Parliament. So it might be the case that um, this, this uh, proceeding, even though it was initiated to vexate the will of the British people, ends up improving our democracy. Okay. Ian, do you think that this process was initiated to vexate the will of the people? No, it wasn't. It was initiated so that there was a degree of scrutiny about the Brexit process. Um, I very much welcomed your other guests' sort of comments on parliamentary sovereignty. That is entirely correct. I don't quite know why we would challenge the aims and the motives and the principles of the people that brought this case. As they're going, I mean, ultimately what has happened here is that as soon as the Brexit vote took place, it was, it's a very vague vote. I mean, you can leave the EU in any number of ways, for instance, by staying in the single market or the customs union, and you can do it one way or another. You have to trigger Article 50. And in that process, the government has tried to amass a tremendous amount of executive power to itself, not just in triggering Article 50, but also in the kind of Brexit that it is going to deliver. This is a very common trend. You very often see it whenever a government goes out there and says, we understand the will of the people, we symbolize the patriotic spirit. Usually what they're doing is trying to get you to confuse the interests of the country with the interests of the government. And this case, if it is won against the government, would actually do an awful lot to limit their ability to do precisely that. So, so Ben, it will defang the executive powers of the government and restore, as, as you said, that sovereignty to parliament. So you'd be happy with that, right? 
Well, I think on that issue, Ian and I are both in agreement. The, pro the, the reason I question the motives is that every single person that has brought this motion is from the Remain camp. It's being funded by the Remain camp. It's quite clearly um, an attempt to uh, vexate the, the will of the British people. And, uh, uh, you know, I, I oppose them for their motives, um, but they may accidentally rather than intentionally mm. improve British democracy. What these people don't understand, what none of these people uh, don't understand is they're, they're very much like uh, like a Japanese chap on a, on a deserted Pacific island in the 1950s still fighting the Second World War. It's over. This country is leaving the European Union and there's not really any such thing as a hard or, or soft Brexit. And especially on the issue of free movement, um, if, if, if Theresa May makes a deal with Brussels that keeps the United Kingdom in uh, the 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 Schengen plus the free movement zone that will be the end of her political career um, the the reason that Brexit happened um, is for 20 years 77 percent of this country has been ignored over their views right. on immigration and if you do that eventually you'll build up a, a head of steam that will explode and that's really what 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 happened yeah, okay, um, there are a lot of other issues sure, in let me bring in as well Ian, and of course let, I let me bring in that. Ian here Ian we're, we're trying to sort of well, we're, we're all guessing uh, about the uh, intentions of the petitioners. But let me, let me ask you, Ian, you, you don't have any hope whatsoever that Brexit in any way, shape or form will be overturned, do you? Uh, it won't be by this case. All this case does is trigger a, you know, a parliamentary vote as to whether you trigger Article 50. There is still a chance that Brexit will be stopped, yeah. So, I mean, this is the confusion. Your other guest is very confused about a series of matters, some of them factual and some of them about opinion. Um, one of them is this idea that Brexit has already happened. I mean, Brexit has not already happened. There are two and a half years in no, which I didn't say, I didn't, this I didn't, process I didn't could say potentially it's actually be stopped, or more, the point, or more the importantly, point, the point could I'm, be watered the point down. I make is so that it's the way going that this will it's operate is that at almost any point over the next two and a half years, if there was enough of a public movement against Brexit, if the economic circumstances were severe enough, if we saw a continuing decline of sterling or of employment in this country, a severing of our trade relationships in a way that looked like it would cause severe damage to the lifestyles of the people of Great Britain, there may well be a swing against Brexit. There's still time for that. What's intriguing is that supporters of Brexit are so nervous about what they have engaged upon that they're very keen to pretend that this is not the case. But I have to say that factually, and also morally and politically, it is the case. OK, so Ben, Ian is suggesting that there might already be some sort of buyer's remorse, and maybe if it went to a referendum again, we might not so, uh, be so sure about the results? Well, uh, as I say, the, the, these people, the sort of the, the liberal metropolitan establishment, if you like, their, their day is done. The, I spoke at a debate at the, at the third way, um, on, the, on the third way at the uh, London School of Economics last night, which is where the third way originated from, Anthony Giddens thinking. Um, and everyone on the debate why we disagreed everyone in the debate why we disagreed on many issues agreed that the era of the third way is over um, brexit hasn't happened yet I, I completely agree with 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 ian on that what i'm saying is it will happen i can guarantee that um, just like donald trump will be the next president of the united states and all these people sitting in london saying oh it's terrible it can't happen you know the people have got it wrong the people don't understand the people understand very well indeed um, they've had enough of third-way politics. They've had enough of centrism across Europe um, and the West. A revolution is sweeping. Uh, and because these people have grown up over the last 20 years understanding only third-way politics and the Blairite way of doing things, it's going to be a very, very uncomfortable next decade for them. Uh, Ian, let me ask you about the, the judges. There's been tremendous scrutiny uh, on those, those judges in every publication, from, from the BBC to the left-wing publications to the right-wing publications, profiles on them, what their links to Europe are, what type of people they are, how old they are, what's their family life. Massive scrutiny. How hard is it going to be for the judges to convince the public that they are making this decision based on the law and, and not on politics? I mean, these are very, very senior judges. They're very sober people, very sensible people, and they will make their decision based on the law. That's what the first decision was made on, a very sound and a very interesting point of law that defended English freedoms, very ancient English freedoms. And you're quite right. The response from the press and from Brexiters in Parliament and outside, which has been pretty typical of the quite hysterical and deeply shrill emotional response to this process that they've demonstrated, has been to attack them personally, 
has been to attack the claimants personally, has been an attitude so ferocious in its aggression that there has been death threats against these people, and to try and basically create an even more toxic political environment in which we operate. It will not affect the judge's judgment, but what concerns us is that really further down the line, less confident judicial figures may feel the need to go with government, always easiest when you come to a case like this, because of the kind of targeted anger, the targeted aggression that we have seen from Brexit supporters towards the judiciary. Ben, there was targeted anger uh, towards the High Court judges initially when when they said, yes, you know, this can go forward and this, this will go to Parliament. Then the government uh, appealed. If these Supreme Court judges, these 11, rule against the government this time around, are you expecting a similar sort of backlash? Uh, we saw the Daily Mail almost, almost smear them. You, you'd agree that that wasn't very nice? Uh, well, you're putting words into my mouth there. I think the, the, the Daily Mail is a, is a great newspaper, which is why it's the most popular newspaper in Britain. Um, however, um, essentially, I agree with everything uh, that Ian has just said. Um, if you watch the, the rolling coverage uh, of the Supreme Court decision, which is um, a great privilege granted to us as, as, as free citizens, we can, we can watch our laws being made and, and, and our laws then being challenged and legal precedents being set at the highest level. Um, if you watch that um, and you are someone who believes passionately in democracy, I think you will be heartened by, by what you see. Um, this is an extremely high level intelligent exchange between uh, people at the, at the very top of the British legal system, which has many flaws, um, many, many flaws indeed. However, um, in terms of the global leaderboard, um, this is still a, a great country in terms of justice. And so um, I, I watch these proceedings with, with concern and uh, with suspicion over the motivations for, for this uh, case being launched, but I also watch them with great pride in my country. And of course, I don't think that uh, members of the judiciary should have uh, death threats thrown at them. Um, that's uh, totally despicable, and, and I hope um, that the, the, the people responsible are held to account um, for, these, uh, the, for, for that vexatious attempt uh, to challenge the, the, the British democratic process, just as um, I hope the people that are attempting to ignore uh, and silence uh, the silent majority in Britain are held to account for their stance as well. Okay, I'm really interested to see uh, Sorry, I'm how the judges... Can I come back on okay, that? Because okay, that very finally, 20 seconds, please, Ian, because we, we, we are out of time. So 20 yeah, seconds. Well, I mean, the is, I mean, to compare someone who's threatening violence against someone with someone who's saying, well, they want to rerun a referendum is really quite far off the level and uh, bizarre. No, there's, been, look, there's been threats of violence on both sides. What I'm saying is I don't, in, I don't endorse any attempt to vexate um, the, uh, the, uh, the fair and just process and, and the, 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 the process of British democracy. Um, there's obviously a, a sliding scale. At the top of that scale, you've, you've got awful things like death threats, and at the bottom of the scale, you've got things like legal challenges. Um, and I do recognise absolutely the difference between them. Um, I, I, I agree uh, with, with Ian that the, the environment is, is toxic. Um, uh, I, I'm just saying that I don't endorse any attempt to subvert the will of the British people. Ian, does, does that sound reasonable to you? Whether it is outrageous and violent or whether it is sober um, and slow. Okay, Ian, are you satisfied with that? I mean, it's an improvement on the first statement, but it still seems a completely bizarre comparison to have made. There haven't been any violent threats made against Brexit people. I mean, you know, you get your occasional shouting on That's um, absolutely Twitter. not true. This That's absolutely specific. not true I mean, this was all. something that happened in N court Nigel that the judges Farage, actually had at Nigel the beginning Farage of the case to warn this cannot basis. happen or else there's violence against Nigel people Farage taking place in this courtroom. Nigel Farage threats on a weekly basis. You do realise that. You do realize no, no, that's fine. That, that it's the distinction is that actually there was a warning many, many from judges oh, so in this case that, that because of the extent of press vitriol, there had been threats to the security of the people involved in the case. I mean, it should be very easy to say we condemn right, this. Right, but we I, should also, not have I also it, consider than threats than to elected representatives in this country. That someone said a on Twitter threat. at some point. I don't, attempt to I don't rerun a referendum. Any, any, no, no, no. Look, look. Any threat to any citizen of the United Kingdom, whether they are a Supreme Court judge or whether they are 
someone who is unemployed and on benefits is totally unacceptable. Okay. This idea that you, know, you shouldn't be threatening Supreme Court judges, but it's, it's not as serious to threaten Nigel Farage, is absolutely outrageous. OK, you both made your point. Unfortunately, I've got to put a lot on it because we are out of time. Gentlemen, it's been a pleasure having you on the programme. Ian Dunt and Ben Harris-Quinney, thank you very much for joining us. In today's picture this, hundreds of people have gathered in Oakland, California for a candlelight vigil for the victims of a fire at a warehouse party. The death toll has risen to at least 36, making it the deadliest U.S. fire in more than a decade. Let's take a look. You've been watching this edition of the Newsmakers with me, Imran Garda. Thank you for watching. See you tomorrow. Bye-bye.